Perfect. Well, um, the topic tonight is about vocal terminology and the um, challenges that I had um, assembling this book um, called A Dictionary for the Modern Singer. And um, this book is um, published by Scarecrow Press, Roman and Little, which is a subdivision of Roman and Littlefield. Um, and um, it's basically a, a general lexicon for undergraduate voice students as they set off on their journey through voice, exploring a wide range of topics. Um, there's a bit of a classical bias to it because I'm a classical pedagogue, but I tried to make nods to musical theater and to um, various um, CCM styles as well. Um, so the product description here that I have on this page is um, it's part of a series, um, and that's the Dictionaries for the Modern Musician series. The idea behind this series is that there will eventually be 12 books, each devoted to a different instrument. So a dictionary for the modern flute player, clarinetist, trumpet player, piano player, singer. About four of these volumes are out so far, and most of them have been contracted and will appear over the next several years. So um, uh, some challenges that I countered were this book was part of a series, so everything had to conform to uh, various parameters that were set up by the publisher in advance. Um, they had to be of a very specific length. Um, so obviously this could be um, of encyclopedic length, but it couldn't be because according to Roman, Little, Roman and Littlefield, I had to um, uh, keep this at about 256 pages or so. Um, also, the dictionary had to be very inclusive. I had to make nods to all sorts of different styles. And I only had about a year and a half to write it, which was a really ambitious timeline. Um, and so some guiding parameters that I had when I put together this work is that it was supposed to be a modern practical dictionary, not an historical one. Um, it was supposed to be a generalist dictionary, not one for specialists. There was going to be an emphasis on breadth rather than depth, and an emphasis on brevity rather than length. And I have this um, a, a few examples here to show what this looks like. And I hope some of you who have been able to log in tonight have been able to get a copy of this, because I would love for you to ask me specific questions that are from the dictionary itself. Um, a lot of the images here were either from public domain sources or we had to generate them ourselves. And people like Scott McCoy were very generous in sharing their copy uh, there are images that were under copyright with me, so I'm really grateful to those sources as well. Just going to scroll through here to show some excerpts from this book. Um, I also engaged a few guest essayists on um, topics that I thought were really important things for the beginning singer to read about. And the specialists I engaged were Jeannie Levetri to talk about CCM music. John Nix for repertoire selection. Um, I, I thought there needed to be some sort of essay in here on how to go about selecting repertoire. And I decided not to reinvent the wheel because John Nix had a terrific article that was published in the Journal of Singing um, a few years back. And he gave me permission to reprint. Um, Dean Southern has some tips on practicing. Heather Honeycutt is something of an expert on performance anxiety, MPA. So um, I engaged her for an essay as well. And Matt Ed Edwards, who I believe is doing another chat this year. Um, has an essay in my book on what every singer needs to know about audio technology. Um, there are also a bunch of appendices in this book. So there's um, an IPA vowel chart, anatomy diagrams, a FOC chart, a uh, definition of a bel canto, because that's a little more complex than the one paragraph definition that I had to come up with for the book itself, um, a history of singing, um, a timeline, which some people have found to be very fun and others have found to be very controversial. So that's one of my personal favorite parts of the book. Um, there's also appendices on prizes, Pulitzer, Grawmeyer, Tony, essential operas, major song cycles, listening to singers, Karen Wicklin's Singer's Ten Steps to Wellness, and Ingo Tietze gave me permission to reprint his medications and their effects on the voice, which is outdated the second you publish it, and the, his version of that is constantly evolving and being updated on the NCBS website. So here are some examples of some of these appendices. And what I'm scrolling through right now is the extensive bibliography. You can see the bibliography has its own table of contents. <laughs> um, it is a very extensive bibliography because obviously this, the dictionary part of this book only scratches the surface of any of these topics. So the reader is directed toward the bibliography if he or she wants to explore any of these topics in a more in-depth way. 
And um, now I'm going to turn it over to Carrie to kind of get a conversation started, and hopefully we can do some interaction here with um, the many wonderful people who've logged on for this chat tonight. Thanks. And just so everyone knows um, that Matt is kind of flying blind. He uh, can't see the video, so he doesn't know when I pop on and off. Um, but I hope some of you could see what he went through quickly because it's just extensive, this book. Um, Matt, tell me, you just mentioned that the history of singing you, was controversial, you found, since publishing? It's, it's kind of just um, a fun list, um, and it's something that I really enjoy putting together. What are the significant events within... Um, my bias tended to be more classical vocal pedagogy, so I listed um, historical treatises in there, the invention of the laryngoscope, um, mm -hmm. and I went back to the be beginning of recorded history. Um, actually, in the second printing of this book, I've decided to change one article, and that's a history of singing, because uh, obviously a, a history of singing is kind of a ridiculous thesis. I mean, the history of singing could involve so many things, and obviously there are a lot of works and performers and uh, things that happened throughout the entire history of singing that I left out. But it's something of a fun list. Um, so everyone who reads it's going to um, see favorite things of theirs that I missed. Mm -hmm. um, nice. But I've also had um, people like Martha Randall, who's president of the American Academy of Teachers of Singing, say that she absolutely loves those two pages of the book and she photocopies it for all of her um, pedagogy students. So. Oh, there's so many references I can see for our students. It's just a remarkable resource and it covers not only musical terms but like you said how to practice repertoire and you cover both CC, you include experts on both CCM and classical. So it really is a remarkable resource. I noticed you said I think in the foreword that um, you stated the, that objectivity was difficult to achieve. Yes. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, a dictionary needs to be uh, factual and as um, objective as possible. And I was basically more of an editor than an author sometimes because I was relying on other people who had defined these terms so many times before um, throughout the history of vocal pedagogy and with treatises both ancient and modern. And even though I cited other authors, a bias came through by the ones I chose to cite. So if various people would define belting in different ways, ultimately, if they're contradicting each other, I had to choose between one and not another. So, um, and it's not always clear which sources I cited, although um, I tried to, I, I did try to cite, to refer to as many resources as possible, reputable resources as possible when I, when I make this. But when you're defining things within vocal pedagogy with everyone having their own terminology and different books wording things in different ways, um, uh, objectivity was a huge challenge. I think our profession is becoming more and more on the same page with terminology, and I think the Vocopedia, which Nats is sponsoring, is a huge step toward that. Um, but uh, I was worried about uh, these definitions being the one and only authoritative definition because no such thing exists. Eventually I had to make a decision between, uh, between several definitions that maybe contradicted each other. Right. I, actually, I would, it brings me to a great question. Tell us about how this came to be. How did this project come into your life and was it something that you always wanted to do? Um, it actually found me, this project. Uh, the series, um, the, the first book in the series called A Dictionary for the Modern Flutist, which came out, I believe, in 2009. Um, Bennett Graff at Scarecrow Press had the idea for an entire uh, series, um, each dedicated to a different instrument. And to find the singer's volume, he um, contacted Alan Henderson, um, who's president, uh, obviously executive director of National Association of Teachers of Singing. and. Um, came up with a list of names of people who would, who would be willing to write this book. Um, I'm not positive I'm the first person they asked to do this um, because I think um, I, I was y young enough and naive enough to um, accept such a challenge. <laughs> um, but um, they were looking for a generalist. They were looking for someone who, um, in academia, maybe who needed a project for their tenure and promotion. Right. Um, portfolio and uh, someone who was willing to say yes to a whole lot of work for not a whole lot of pay. Right. Um, had I been older and wiser, I might have said no to this because it wound up being such a challenge. Yeah. Uh, but I I, th they, they saw me coming and I was, uh, like I said, naive enough to say yes and 
three and a half years later, it, it, it's out and meeting mostly positive reviews. And I've had a lot of people um, start a lot of great conversations with me about it. Uh, some people say, well, well, congratulations, because it is a remarkable contribution to our our field. And uh, I, for one, thank you very much. I know you sacrificed a lot, as did your family, to achieve this. Um, let, let's open it up to our chatters. Uh, so. David may pop back on and help us, but uh, go ahead, David. You explain all this so much better than I. Hi there, everybody. Um, so one of the wonderful things about this technology, if you are new to it, is that you have the power to ask a question in real time. I can see who's on the seminar. I can see whether or not you have a microphone, and you are now all presently muted. Um, I can unmute you so that you can ask your question and then mute you back again so that we don't hear the dog barking, etc. cetera. Um, if you want to ask a question next to your name, you'll see a, a little series of columns. The one with a hand, that is to raise your hand to ask a question. So click on that hand and that will tell me that you have a question you'd like to ask. I can see there are a few people online who do not have a microphone, in which case you would go down to the question box which is, uh, uh, if for PC users, it's on the right hand of your screen. Mac users, it may be on the left hand, I'm not sure. On the right hand side. It is on the right, okay. Yeah. And, it and, and it says questions. Open up that box, and you can type your questions into that box. Both Kari and I will see that, and we will read the question aloud. And uh, Dr. Hope will answer you live in real time. You also control the size of the window in which you are seeing us. You can drag it open. You can make it full size to your screen. So if it's not exactly to your liking, uh, whether you want to make it larger or smaller, you control that. And you can also control how you see the webcams versus the slideshow presentation. You can make the webcams bigger or the slideshow bigger. There's a little uh, sideways equal sign separating the webcams and the slideshow. You just drag that one way or another, and the screen will move for you. So with that in mind, uh, if there are any questions at this point uh, regarding the terminology uh, used in the book or anything else about the book I'd like to ask, I see Julia has a question. Yep. All right, so Julia, you. I'm going to unmute you. How are you? Oh, I'm so happy to be unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Hi, Matthew. What an amazingly yep. comprehensive uh, project. I, I have to apologize and say I have not seen the actual book, just what you've shown us so far. But I'm wondering, you said you had kind of a classical pedagogue's bias. Were there certain areas I'm sure that you were able to draw on your own knowledge and, and experience in who to contact right. for guest essays? What were some areas where you felt as a classical pedagogue that you were under-equipped? that you had to educate yourself in order to know how to proceed? Definitely the first thing that comes to mind uh, is the audio technology and the amplification and the microphones. All of that stuff had to be in the book because they didn't want this to be just a classical book. They wanted to have something for people who sang other genres to nibble on. Um, and I'm completely out of my idiom with um, technological things like that, singing with the mic amplifiers. So the first person I called was Matt Edwards, who this was back in 2011, and he was at that time making a big name for himself, going around the country doing all these workshops with um, microphones and with amplification. And so he authored about 15 of the definitions in my book and wrote a big essay for the, the back of the book. Um, in terms of some of the other definitions, um, I was able to fly okay on my own sometimes because they were uh, most the definitions in this book are very very short um, so I would do research on my own come up with a short definition and then I would usually have someone who knew more than me about that topic be a proofreader um, mm -hmm. and I'm really grateful to a lot of my colleagues who took the time to do that gratis um, to advise me how to word or phrase things a little bit differently but definitely the the CCM stuff um, particularly the the audio technology and microphones. Um, did you, was, is there a caveat as well? You mentioned Ingo's work was out, was out of date immediately, the medications. Oh. Is there something in the audio technology? I would imagine that's also 
complete, just like my phone, right? It's, it's out of date as soon as it's talked about. Well, just to clarify, I was saying that um, any print book is going to be out of date. And so when I mentioned about, um, it wasn't Dr. Tietze who's out of date at all because his website, um, his NCBS website is current because it's not in print form. They can continue to update that every single day. Um, so uh, the minute this was published back in April, it was kind of frozen in time. And so probably some of these medications and certainly the audio technology in five years is going to be out of date also. Mm -hmm. um, but um, that's, that's the nature of any print book. Right. Um, one other point that I should make is that um, this whole idea of one author writing this book is um, in and of itself a little problematic and perhaps even controversial. And it really wouldn't work if this were geared toward um, uh, n not a young audience. It's very much geared toward the undergraduate student. Um, to get a general taste of everything before they venture into a more specialized resource. If you think of something like the New Harvard Dictionary, that was written by many, many authors. So that's one approach to writing big reference works like this. If it's a graduate level or professional level reference work, it probably should have many authors with an editor, but that wasn't really the philosophy behind the series. They wanted this to be a general undergraduate textbook, and most of the definitions in this book are about one paragraph long. They, they don't really go too in-depth on any one topic. Thank you so much, Julia. Yeah, would you consider, uh, oh, thank you, Julia. Mm -hmm. um, you. While we're waiting for some other hands to come up, um, Matt, would you, what's, talk to us a little bit about the sources you used, and would you consider the New Groves um, Dictionary of Music a, a previous source to yours? and or how are they different? Well, the New Grove is probably the opposite of extreme of this um, Roman and Littlefield series because the New Grove is written by hundreds if not thousands of authors, each one writing uh, very, um, in a very in-depth way on lots of topics, all written by people who are, have extreme specialties. I think the some of the topics, even within the New Grove, like the, the opera article, they'll have a Baroque specialist writing the Baroque section, the classical opera specialist writing the classical section. So really it's the opposite extreme. Certainly that is the go-to resource for musicologists. If you do any sort of work, you, the first place you go is to the New Grove. So I did consult it on occasion, but a lot of the definitions in there are way longer than I could have um, ever used for this dictionary. So for instance, you know, the article in Oratorio in the New Grove is a, an article of great length. Um, here I had to reduce it to one paragraph. So um, the New Grove actually wasn't all that helpful for this because it was way too much information. I just had to distill um, how to, what I wanted the average sophomore in a voice performance degree program to know and summarize it within a few sentences. That's a great point for our chatters to know about, that it's very, very succinct and um a definition, that you right. weren't going to be an expert, that you were trying to give somebody a resource. And that's what the bibliography is for. So um, the bibliography points towards specialist resources in all these different topics. So if you want to know more about a certain era of art song, like German art song, there are some resources in the bibliography for entire books that are devoted to that genre. Matt, I have a question for you. Um, sure. I think one of the great challenges for uh, voice teachers throughout time has been a unification of terminology so that we all know what we're all talking about because <laughs> um, our profession is still so based in imagery and, and sound, um, you know, auditory cues and, and images, etc. So in writing this book, I'd like to ask whether any of the um, definitions or any of the research that in doing it then solidified your own uh, personal, as a teacher, perceptions. Uh, maybe there were, I mean, for me, there are sometimes with many one with a topic, many different ways of looking at it. Did, it, did the research here hone that in a way that you now are more clearly defined in your own self as a teacher for what all these things are? I think it certainly did. There's no particular definition that comes to mind, but I'm kind of a firm believer in you don't really understand something until you're forced to teach it. So with a lot of these definitions, if I was a little hazy on what it meant or I'd been tossing around a term um, in a perfunctory way, 
actually having to write it in a clear way and put it in writing helped that to make uh, that term to make a little more sen more sense to me. Um, sometimes I got myself a little more confused um, when I came across different authors having different perspectives of the exact same thing. And this this especially happened with the less fact based terminology with some of the imagery or the old Italian bel canto ideas that came out of the you know 19th and early 20th century treatises. Uh, one that comes to mind is pear-shaped tone, which seems to mean different things to lots of different people. So I believe in my book I have several different definitions of what pear shapes might mean. Um, obviously not a fact-based term, but um, something that you do read about every once in a while. So um, I learned a lot by writing this just by running across n new twists and turns on things that I hadn't heard before. Yeah, you know, I've seen uh, excerpts from the book and, and things like that, pear-shaped tone, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily expect to see that in a dictionary as defined. And, and so that's very interesting to me. The dictionary is comprehensive in ways that we don't expect a dictionary to be. Can you give us more examples of those types of definitions? Or do you have other pages or any excerpts to call up? We can still see your screen. I have the book right in front of me. Um, I'd actually prefer maybe if the readers would, um, uh, if anyone has a book in front of them, to point some out to me rather than just me paging through um, on my own. It was a big challenge though, David, to figure out what to put in and what to leave out, what's worthy of putting in, what's too obvious, um, and what's too perfunctory, and what's too detailed, you know, what, what, sh what should I not have been in there. We made the very early decision to not include composers and works, just because I saw that as a very, very slippery slope that would blow up the book past 250 pages. Um, if you try to include every composer of classical music and jazz and musical theater, and the list goes on and on. Same thing with works. Um, uh, that's something that was going to be a little too cumbersome to get under control. By leaving out composers and works, I was able to get this book within a manage manageable length. So, but that did allow room for some of those fun terms that maybe are a little off the beaten path. Like the pear-shaped tone. Like the pear-shaped tone, right. Uh, Julia is asking, is there an online component to the book currently, or is there one expected? There is not currently an online component to the book, but, but that's a great idea. I'm hoping there will be one once more books in the series um, come out. It, there's a very long timeline with this series. Um, and most of the, a lot of the other authors running would have asked for extensions, and so it's taking longer. Um, I wasn't aware that was an option to ask for an extension. Otherwise, I certainly would have as well. I would have in trouble if I didn't finish it in time. So I finished it, and then other people got extensions too. So it's going to take most of the decade, I think, for the series to come out. Um, well, we're still um, hoping people will come with some questions. Um, but again, as we uh, wait, um, Matt, was there a favorite section for you or, or a section that you learned something unexpected or I mean I'm sure you had you couldn't um, indulge because you were on such a deadline but was there a particular area that you became more educated on unexpectedly one of the appendices I really enjoyed putting together even though it took a heck of a lot of time was the Fox chart and if you have the book in front of you, that's going to be on page um, 247. Uh, there are a lot of strange ideas floating around about Fox and the way we use the translations of the German Fox system in this mm -hmm. country. Um, the, 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 some of the English, the way we use those in English-speaking houses and in the opera profession don't align at all with um, the Kloiber Fox system that they use in Germany. So I learned a lot by doing that, and I believe my um, appendix here, Appendix C, is the first little concise Fox chart that follows the Kloiber um, in any reference source that I've seen. Unless you buy the all-German uh, volume of the Kloiber and really try and plow your way through it, I'm pretty proud of um, how I was able to create a succinct um, uh, appendix, appendix there for English-speaking students to really understand what that German Fox system is all about. Yeah, and I I also, well, it was great. Um, and then I also pay nods to maybe some of the the French terms that we throw around, or the um, English language terms that we throw around, and we talk. I talk about how that fits in with the German Fox system, and also how it doesn't fit in with the German Fox system. We have a, a question from Martha Howe, and she's asking. I'm curious if you have defined support 
or placements. Um, go ahead, I'll let you answer. I did look it up, so I have it in front of me. If you, <laughs> I did. I did make a, take a take a stab at support. I'm not. I don't can't remember if I took a stab at placement or not. Here, you read support, and I'll look up placement. I, I apparently really took the coward's way out here, but I don't dislike this definition. Um, the control of one's exhalation while singing, closely related to breath management. So I made it some. I made support something of an equivalent to breath management and the control of the singer's exhalation. But obviously, that's something we could talk about for a long time because it could be rather subjective. Uh, and why don't you read placement is on one thirty eight, page one thirty eight, and because it might um, facilitate some conversation. A prevalent but subjective concept in voice teaching that involves placing the voice, and that's in quotation marks to achieve optimal resonance. Some teachers who advocate correct placement do so through descri describing sensation, which is profoundly subjective, as the perception of sensation differs from singer to singer. Other teachers, however, view placement as synonymous with vowel modification, which makes the technique considerably more objective and fact-based. I mean, it's great how you handled these controversial words. Because your job was not, yeah, yeah go ahead. I think I was trying to paint, play nods to a couple things that placement to some teachers um, has to do with sensation and resonance. And placement to other teachers is an exact same thing to vowels. Are vowels and placements really distinct from one another? When you opt for a different placement, are you really just modifying the vowel that you're using? So I try to, in a very succinct way, um, allude to all these different things that placement could mean. Mm -hmm. Martha says, very well done. So high praise. <laughs> Thank you. We have another question from Julia. Julia, your mic is live. Hi. So you, you just uh, mentioned there some teachers say this and some teachers say that. Are there, are there um, definitions where it's so close, what you're talking about is so closely linked with one particular pedagogue that you name names? Or is that, was that something that categorically you decided to leave out of the definitions. Do you know what I mean? I tried not to name names unless I was specifically citing um, something that was part of someone's treaties, where there, there was only one person really who that's associated with. For instance, the National Schools of Singing and the National Schools of Breathing, that's very Richard Miller. He mm -hmm. published a seminal work on that, so uh, there, there was a name, a name drop there. Um, in some circ circumstances. Um, something like somatic voice work, if I had mentioned that as a CCM style, obviously that's linked to Jeannie Lovetri. Um, but for the most part, um, I, I, if it's something that a lot of pedagogues are on the same page about, I tried not to, um, to, to show any bias toward any one particular pedagogue. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the whole book does have a bias toward the, the group think that Nat subscribes to within classical uh, pedagogy, which is that kind of modern fact-based Richard Miller, international Italian schools. Scott McCoy's built on that, although he approaches um, acoustics in a, in, a, in a little bit different of a way, um, in, in a more modern sort of way. Um, but um, I, I didn't, I deliberately tried not to get too gimmicky or align myself with any more peripheral pedagogues or controversial pedagogues. Um, within vocal pedagogy. Um, classical, that is. Um, with CCM vocal pedagogy, I think that topic is still too new. And I do have, um, just have different definitions related to somatic voice work and estel and speech level singing. I, I think there are a lot of schools of CCM pedagogy that are still uh, resolving itself and percolating. Mm -hmm. would, you, uh, would you have, would you repeat this experience? It sounds like it was extremely intense. Do you, do you have another idea? Like, and now I want to address this. Um, well, I think the book has served its purpose. I'm, I'm fully prepared at some point to have a second edition of this book because I think I'm going to need it. Um, I think the book's going to need it. I've already found little things that I'd like to reword here and there. And in the second printing, I've already fixed a few typos and everything. I have yeah. ideas for more appendices. So I'm hoping that in five to ten years, uh, I'll be, have the opportunity for an expanded um, edition of this book. One appendix that... Um, I think there's a need for that I'm going to put in the next edition, if I'm uh, privileged enough to have one, is I'd like for there to be some sort of IPA chart of proper names in Italian operas. 
like how do we know it's Zerolina versus Zerolina? I, I haven't really found a good resource in a print volume for proper names. Um, there's the Zebes and Dudens dictionaries for German, and there's the Warnens, which is out of print and very expensive for French. There's nothing at all for Italian, so a little three-page appendix for proper names in um, opera, I think, it would be a really necessary resource for undergrads. So I'm getting ideas like that all the time for how I might revise this in the future. Yeah, you're the right guy for the job, then. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. We have another question from Blyce. Blyce, your microphone is live. Go ahead. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi, Matthew. Uh, Blythe Walker. I'm really uh, enjoying the conversation. I'm very inspired to uh, read the book, get the book and read it. So, um, But I, I have a specific question. I'm very interested in historical pedagogy and wonder what, um, uh, if you address, talked about, you know, Garcia, Lamperti, famous treatises, Meinige Zangkunst, Caruso's book, you know, those kinds of, you know, sort of, See, old-fashioned, but but uh, uh, you know when you mentioned pear-shaped tones, I my ears kind of perked up because uh, it's it's interesting to read what the what the uh, older people uh, say. But anyway, I'm just curious what what your approach to the historical pedagogues are is. I did try and pay it out to historical pedagogues, and um, that is not this. That's one of the areas. Going back to a, an earlier question, where I had to educate myself a little bit because. Mm -hmm. Um, I have read Vocal Wisdom, I have read the Stark book, but um, th there are certainly people, um, my predecessor as editor of Voice Prints for Nice that comes to mind, Dan Chigo spends hours every day in the library <laughs> exploring these <laughs> pedagogues, and that's not, not who I am. But yeah. um, I, I, did, I did pay homage to some of them. I have both Garcia's in there, I have Lamperti in there. Certainly the major treatises that they wrote are mostly in there. Um, I'm not sure Caruso's book is in there, but certainly mm -hmm. Caruso is as a performer. Um, yeah. so, and I also did try to tackle bel canto and what that means, and I have a whole appendix devoted to that. Um, I think James Stark probably is the foremost expert in the world right now on what does bel canto mean, because he has an yeah. entire book called bel canto. But, sure, um, sure. And the timeline also, I have a little bit of fun with the historical pedagogy, and I tried to highlight the different treatises that were written. Um, uh, I enjoy, for that topic, um, I was really influenced by Richard Miller's essay. I think it was in the original Saddle Off book on, when he starts with Tosi, way back to the ornamentation treatises and moves forward. Um, and so those major works that Miller identified in that, uh, in that essay, I tried to have individual definitions so that modern students could become familiar with, um, with those works. Cool. I'm looking forward to it, especially the uh, timeline. I'm a sucker for a good timeline. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Blythe. Uh, yeah, and also in your essay, uh, um, in the essays um, section, mm -hmm. you write about, you use somebody, uh, Heather Winter Honeycutt's coping with musical performance anxiety. Yes. Very, I mean, I, you're, Essays are so interesting because you've chosen such varied topics um, within those, what, five essays, I believe, that are included. Mm -hmm. So just for our uh, audience, since that is not on our screen, um, the first essay is Classical and Contemporary Commercial Music, and that's Jeanette Lavetri. And then, as Matt mentioned, our John Nix article about criteria for selecting repertoire. And then Practicing 101, 10 Tips uh, by Dean Southern. And then the fourth one is Coping with Musical Performance, Anxiety by Heather Winter Honeycutt. And then finally, Matt Edwards' article on what every singer needs to know about audio technology, which you've already mentioned. So as our, our chatters can see, it's quite varied. Um, I'd love specifically to know about the performance anxiety choice. And just in general, how did you choose of all the articles out there what to include? These um, topics, these five topics, and certainly I could have picked more, um, it's somewhat arbitrary and somewhat just the need to be concise that I had to limit it to five. Um, these were topics that deserve more than a paragraph in a dictionary. They weren't things I could define concisely, but they were certainly things that I thought were important for uh, students of singing. Um, I thought that young singers should know about these topics. Performance anxiety, I think, is something that a lot of young classical singers really struggle with. 
And so fortunately, um, uh, I'm a friend of, Heather's a friend of mine, and I knew this was one of her areas of expertise. She's done a lot of research on it. She had a three-part article in the Journal of Singing, I think, two years ago on this very topic. And she's done a really terrific job uh, kind of systematizing musical performance anxiety. She has, um, actually in the book I've reprinted, she has some surveys that you can ask yourself, and, and she gives real strategies for improving various aspects of musical performance anxiety, MPA is what she calls it. So I'm grateful that she was willing to um, contribute this essay for the book and distill this in a way that our readers could benefit from. That's great. I love also um, you've included in Appendix G the Tony Award for Best Musical. <laughs> yeah, obviously that was, that was um, one of the more fun ones. But um, since I had listed all the, uh, the the more challenging appendix to put together was the Pulitzer and Grawmeyer's awards that were limited to vocal music. I think those are interesting because these are um, these are really significant vocal compositions um, that have been written in recent years that a lot of readers might not be familiar with. Um, so giving a nod to something non-classical, non-Western art music, I did include some other awards too, and the Tony Awards are in there. Obviously, you can look those up on the internet also, but I just um, really was trying to pay homage to a lot of different styles and genres in the appendixes. Well, and again, you lead us, um, I know there's quite a bit you do, since I'm a singing race specialist, I, of course, was interested in terms such as nodules and, and uh, lesions and other things in that nature. And I, of course, love that you included my colleague, uh, Karen Wickland's uh, Singer's Ten Steps to Wellness. I like that article very much, and I think that's really um, a nice, concise place to go for when I think about my undergraduate students who have wonderful voices but have no idea how to take care of them. Um, it, I think that should be mandatory reading for all freshmen. That's great. Uh, well, you, everyone can see that, that our chatters tonight, that you know, we're kind of crossing through the entire book, which is just an invaluable resource. Um, why don't, you know, we, we've come back to pear-shaped tone a couple times. Would you mind, let's just revisit that for a minute. Would you, I know it's, a, it's one of the few that you wrote more than a, a small paragraph on, but uh, would you mind just sharing that because that's such an interesting one. This is on page 136. Oh, that's yeah. correct, 136. Pear-shaped tone. A concept that originated in the historical Bel Canto School of Italian singing, this non-scientific term instructs the classical singer to imagine that his or her acoustic space, the oral cavity or pharynx, is shaped like a pear, with the larger end of the pear toward the back of the acoustic space and the stem of the conceptual pear sticking out of the front of the mouth. Similar to yawning, the idea of a pear-shaped space supposedly encourages a low larynx, open throat, and raised, engaged soft palate, all conditions that help cultivate a good classical tone quality. Some voice teachers also use the imagery of a light bulb, which is similar in concept. Second paragraph, the pear-shaped shape has also been um, conjured in discussions of breathing technique. In these discussions, two models are usually evoked, the pear-shaped down paradigm and the pear-shaped up paradigm. In the former, the ribcage is free to move while the pressure is exerted downward toward the pelvis and outward toward the abdomen. In the pear-shaped up di um, paradigm, the ribcage is kept high and stable and the diaphragm and abdomen are primarily used to pump the air. The second approach is widely favored among vocal pedagogues and is more conducive to the Italian breathing technique known as a poncho. So had, is that a term that you obviously had heard before? It's, it's one I had heard, um, yes. I, I do remember um, more than one voice teacher mentioning it on, uh, on an occasion or two. And at the time, I had no idea what it meant. And years later, I read Cornelius Reed's definition and later Inga Tietz's definition and just heard the term kind of tossed around um, in conversation um, with vocal pedagogues. I remember at the Nats intern program, um, someone mentioning um, the pear-shaped tone over lunch one day. So um, I find it to be a fascinating term because everyone seems to have their own spin on what it means. It's so interesting to find that in here because it's actually, I mean, I've heard it probably in passing, but it's not one that any of my teachers ever spent time on. So I know you must have had to eliminate a lot of terms or debated about a lot of terms. Did you, of course? 
I did, and, and the moment I had sent it in to um, the publisher, I started uh, compiling a list of terms that I want to include in the next edition. So it's it's a situation where a deadline passes, and then the work is um, where where the work is going to be what it's going to be. But really, this had I written this five years from now, it would be a lot different. And if I write this when I'm 80, an 80 year old man, it's going to be a lot different too. So. Um, these were the terms that the, the body of terms that I came up with in by May thirty first, twenty thirteen. I love what Julia said. You're the right man for the job because I can imagine now you must um, you must go through your day constantly thinking or hearing terms and thinking, oh, I need to include that in the next edition. Right. Yeah. I also asked my um, freshman over the period of several years. Um, in about November, I'm like, what terms have I thrown at you so far this year that um, that you've never you hadn't heard in high school that are that are new terms for you? And I, there were some things that were so obvious uh, that I missed them. Like, for example, off book. Everyone in the world knows what that means, right? Well, some 18 year olds didn't know what it meant to be off book. I mean, that sounds silly to us. But so there's a one sentence definition here for off book. Um, one student, I said, what's the strangest thing I've said to you all year? And they said straw phonation, because they had no idea what straw phonation was. So that wound up becoming a term in the book. Of course. Uh, so. well, giving equal time, since we talked about more historical pedagogy, let's jump to some contemporary, since that's also included in the book. So um, of the word belt, you've included that um, in here. Right. And it's quite a long so, e explanation. Um, but tell us just a little bit about how you chose to define that. Um, one thing that was harder for the contemporary terms are that I didn't have five published definitions to go back to to where there a consensus had evolved. Um, with starting with the 1980s and you know starting with all the Richard Miller books, he had a glossary in every single one, and other pedagogues like Barbara Dosher and Venard had all defined classical terms over and over and over again, and a consensus kind of was beginning to emerge. Mm -hmm. With belts, everyone in the industry uses the term belts, but very few people have written down definitions of what belt is. So for a lot of these terms, I just try to crack at it to, do a, to write my own definition of it um, and include as many different things in terms of what people hear subjectively and also what's happening objectively with vocal function. And I put those into my own words, and I had people read it and say, let me know what you think. Um, for the belt, I remember specifically sh showing it to Jeannie Levetri, um, mm -hmm. who I studied with, with somatic voice work at Shenandoah, and having her weigh in. And um, she liked most of what I wrote and had suggestions for a couple of things to tweak. And then when, I was, when she had helped me with it, then I would show it to someone else. And a lot of the definitions came about that way. Um, it's a little pretentious that my name is on the front of this book because I had so many people help me with so many of these definitions. So while I was the one who was kind of the figurehead and the, and the person doing most of the grunt work, there were lots and lots of people I relied on who knew more than me about this term or that term. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to everyone who helped me write this. Well, you gave you gave everyone credit. It's you you know you definitely in the beginning of the book wrote a, a wonderful. Um, you know, entry that talked about all the people and, and the ways specifically, including our own David Sabella Mills tonight, that had helped you. Yes, David helped me with several of these definitions too. Um, when I got this assignment back in 2011, um, I uh, came up with a list of CCM terms that I knew because it really wasn't my area first and foremost. I've taught a fair amount of musical theater, but other CCM styles I wasn't really familiar with. And so David was one of the people I wrote to, and I said, here's my list of terms. Can you think of any others? And he replied back with about 20 that I had missed. So um, the first year of this project was really just generating that body of terms, and I had lots and lots of people help me with that for the ones well, that. Let's stick with this for a second, Matt, especially now that David's showing his handsome face again. Um, on page 24, where you define, I know it's, uh, it's too much, but would you just maybe read um, a beginning of the word belt? It's a four-paragraph definition, so I'll read the first paragraph. A frequently encountered term that can refer to style, register, and technique used by singers who perform in non-classical styles. Because the word belt can mean so many things, it is often a confusing term to discuss and difficult to define precisely. 
Indeed, felt can serve as a noun, indicating a register or technique, an adjective, describing its tone quality or sound, or a verb, describing what the singer is doing. Perhaps no other word in singing is as multifarious. I really appreciate I, I, and several of the definitions that I've gone through. Um, I can hear your voice in it, and I can hear your sense of really not wanting to be controversial. <laughs> but, you know, but to presenting an idea for us that may stimulate conversation, but at the very least, the reader will understand um, without bias. That's what I'm trying to say. And yeah. it had to have been hard because we as pedagogues have strong opinions about everything, <laughs> as we know. Well, I was very humbled by this project and very honored to get asked to put it together. And... I was perhaps you can tell maybe I'm a little too careful in my um, in my um, uh, style sometimes in how I wrote this because I was obsessed with not wanting to come off as pretentious or not coming off like I knew too much about something. I just thought that would that's not the affect I wanted to give off as a 38 year old vocal pedagogue. So um, I, I left a lot of room here for it could mean this or it could mean this, and my whole the, what I really wanted to do was be objective and also start a conversation. Um, I, I'm hoping that this will pave the way for a more unified definition of some of these terms, especially the ones that have never been put in writing before. And I hope that, um, I, I love it when someone emails me or sees me at a convention and says, I really, really enjoyed your book. For this definition, have you thought of this angle? Have you thought of rewording it to say this? Um, I've already I, I put together a document of all sorts of little tweaks that I want to put into the next edition of the book. and. I love that, being able to uh, try and define these terms even more precisely down the road. Now, well, I think you have a, relations. Go ahead, David. Uh, we do have a question from Julia. Before I unmute your microphone, Julia, <clears throat> I have a question for you about some of those terms that have never been in print before. Can you give us a, an example of possibly some of those terms? Well, since you're asking me the question, David, I think super belts is one of the terms you gave me. And has that ever been put in writing before in a book? <laughs> <laughs> it is okay. now. So. <laughs> I was not fishing, really. I was not thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there are several like that, which are, which are um, terms that I've heard in master classes that are now being used by the industry. Um, I, think, I think a lot of this, I mean, uh, the analogy between this and like folklore, it's passed on by oral tradition before it gets written down. If you think about Homer or the Aeneid or Beowulf or something, it's actually a pretty good analogy to our profession because teachers, famous teachers, start using terms, their students start using them, and later on down the road, it becomes systematized in a, in a book somewhere. Um, and I'm hoping and trusting you gave Richard Lissamore his due credit for that term as well, uh, which I owe him that term as well, having heard him say it in many a seminar. Um, let me move on to Julia. Julia, you are live. Go ahead. Hi. I just wanted to say um, that I think there is such a service being done by even saying that a dictionary of definitions is possible for the students. I just, you know, we just finished a semester, all of us, right? And I always holding studio class at the end of the semester and asking the students, okay, why don't, can you raise your hands? Can you share with the group what are some concepts, what are some terms that have come up this semester that were really key and helpful and or confusing and perplexing to, to you? And, you know, maybe they're just Maybe they're just rather not say anything and get out of there as quickly as possible. But I'm always surprised that I feel like I've been presenting each semester fewer and fewer concepts and repeating them more and more often, trying to really impregnate these things that are most critical into the students. And yet, there we are, and they're not immediately boinging up like a bunch of toasters with these with these seems to me like three tiny little things that I want them to hold on to. So I think the fact that there is a dictionary, aside from it being obviously a wonderful and really rich resource, just a way to emphasize to the voice students that they should be, they should be trying to bring their thinking about singing they should be trying to coalesce it into ideas. And, they sh and if there are things that they don't understand, they should look for definitions. So 
aside from the work itself, just the concept of get to the bottom of it, identify what you don't know, and, and get there is, is really inspiring. And um, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one more question uh, from Edry. Edry, I can unmute your microphone. Hi, uh, it's not really a question. It was just a great big thank you, Matt, for um, all this hard work and bringing this dictionary to fruition. It's just fabulous. Just thank fabulous. you so much, Edry. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm enjoying the, the chat tonight. I've got a little bit of a cold, so <laughs> that's about it for me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think you must get thanked a lot now, uh, Matt. As you, I mean, I know the book has just came out this summer, but are you finding people are so appreciative? The ones I've talked to um, have been very appreciative, and that's uh, that's really uh, gratifying to me. Um, after, yeah, you know, writing a book is a strange thing because you put in, you obsess about it, and you put in three years of your life, and it's all consuming, and then it gets released, and you can. You know, it's like a deafening silence. You know, is anyone out there buying it? Is anyone out there reading it? But then some people are, and um, so that that's really the payback. It's it's for in academic writing, it's never financial payback. It's just all about being putting a service out there for the profession. So if if, if people are find this useful or are inspired by it, that's all the thanks I'll ever need. And Matt, where might we get this book? <laughs> Um, the best place, honestly, to get it is just online shopping, comparing prices. Um, the list price is $75. You can usually find it in the low 50s um, if you look on places like Amazon, and Barnes and & Noble, and Half.com. Um, and, and it's coming down in price a little bit now, more now because it's six months later. And your publisher offered us on our Natch Chat Facebook page. Yes, that's a big discount. That's more than they usually give. It's about 30%, I think. 30% discount for our, our Natch members. So that's a great. And I just cannot strongly encourage all of you enough. I mean, this idea of semantics is really important. And I remember when I first started exploring CCM, you know, and I thought, oh, here we go with a whole another group of people. And now they're disagreeing about terminology. Uh, you know, I uh, you know, and I was a little bit heartbroken. Um, so I was uh, pleased to hear you say at the beginning that you were David, who said you think that we are getting unified. I, um, I don't know if that's true, but fingers crossed that that is true. I think we are, and it'll it'll continue to become more unified as time moves on. So. Well. Well, I can't thank you enough um, for being here tonight and being such a, an engaging um, guest host. And really, personally, I can now thank you publicly for asking me to take over as the Nats Chat moderator. Um, it's been a, a great privilege for me to have done this the last few years, and to now take it into a new forum has been fascinating. Uh, of course, I wouldn't have done it without David holding my hand. <laughs> But um, I, yeah, oh, more than holding, pulling me in the last year. But um, I, I, this must be so pleasing to you now to see the change. It is. I'm so grateful that you've taken it over. I'm so glad it's thriving more than ever. Back in the old AOL days, um, if we had anywhere between 10 and 15 chatters, that was a good night or an average night. And it's just great to see us accommodating up to 100 and having the video chat format and the audio format. So thank you so much, Mary. Oh, well, thank you for, for thinking of me. And, you know, we had to change forums. This has been the third change, I think, since I've taken over, at least third or fourth, because then we started crashing the Nats.org uh, site, and we had to find a new forum. And so it's been a, a very interesting process. But I hope everybody will join us on January 11th, um, where we're going to do um, – I was trying to be clever. The state of the nation, since January is the state of the nation, I decided to do state of the nation, um, state of the Nats. And I want to talk a little bit about the last conference, what you liked, what changes you'd like to see going forward, really just anything within our organization um, that you all want to talk about. Um, so let me just, I see a couple, I just before we sign off, uh, you're you're getting some thank yous, Matt, from people, and um, so I just want you to know that. Um, but anyway, thank you both for being here and all of our chatters, and um, happy holidays to everybody.
real privilege to be a part of this. Thank you. Thanks so much. Have a good evening, everyone.